My goodness, it is so good to be back with you and to see faces and chairs. I can't tell you how difficult it is to preach to an empty room, uh, but to see faces and uh, to understand uh, many of the journeys that we're on together and we're back together. It's very evident that when something's taken from us, the value of it when it's given back to us. And so it's so good. My name is Bill, in case you don't remember that. But uh, it's good to be with you this day as we worship the Lord. Um, There's little doubt that when we entered the shelter at home stage that God was doing some amazing things here. And I look forward to uh, what God's going to do on the other side of this. And just on a personal note, I want to welcome our interns. Woohoo! Will you stand up? Stand up, interns. SK, stand up. You're an intern. We are so blessed with these folks as they work with our students, with their music, with our children. Uh, So much is going on here. So let's see what God's going to do on the other side of uh, this shelter at home. As we gather in this place, I know you're excited about what uh, God may do today and what we expect uh, this day to be all about. And here's where I've settled. I've settled in saying, uh, God, I am releasing my grip on this day. You do with it what you need to do with it because it is not mine. And I've also wrote this at the top of uh, my notebook. Uh, It's something that helps me focus on today. And it's not that we're back in this place that's so important, but that Jesus is in us. That's what's so important. That's what we celebrate. And my goodness, when you think about God's timing for our regathering, with all that's been going on with the COVID-19, with the George Floyd tragedy that we have faced and the things that we are walking through. Uh, We never thought that would ever happen in our life, but yet God's timing has brought us back in this place so we can focus on Him, uh, the one true God. If you're not paying attention, you'll miss what God is doing. Uh, There's little doubt that we are living through some unprecedented times. We never thought we'd have to do a walk through what we've had to walk through. And as we think about that, we realize how out of control life really is. That we thought we were, had a grip on this life and then all of a sudden it was taken away and we ended up sheltering at home. And then we watched the news and the things that are going on today. And we realize that we do not have the technology to stop it. We do not have the knowledge to stop it. We do not have the resources to stop it. But just as we sang earlier with Gordon and Jimmy, uh, God can do that. Surely His goodness and His mercy can stop it. We are in uh, what I understand that no option place. That while we have no control over that and anything that's going on in our world, our option is to understand that while we have no control, that we can focus on the one who does have a control. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that is where we will focus our attention. We will continue to do that here at Get Well today and the day that follows. And with that thought, I invite you to stand. Whether you're in this worship center or whether you're at home watching online, for you to stand out of honor and respect uh, for this almighty God that we get to do life with. And as we do that, that we understand that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And as we stand here today in this first regathering back for worship to honor him, I want us just to be still. Be still and know that he is God. And let's enter into a time of prayer. And then I'm going to pray. God, it is so awesome to be still and know that you're in control. We have no answers. You are our answer. It's good to be back and to be with you as a family of believers. It's good to be back with this group of folks that uh, we call our Get Well family that we get to do life with. 
But most of all, just to be with you, for us to be still and know that you are God. Uh, we have gathered back and we stand and we declare. We declare before you that you are the only God that can give us life. Only God can bring healing and wholeness. Only God can bring protection. Only God can heal our land. And so every person, whether we're in this worship center or whether we're standing in our homes, we declare that you, God, can bring the protection, the healing that we so desperately need. We have walked through some interesting times. And now we understand with all the unknowns that have come against us out of left field that we thought we would never have to face in a lifetime. We know that you're teaching us lessons. Let us not doubt. And let us not uh, wonder about the lessons. Let us understand and then apply those lessons into our life. Father, gathering for worship today, we don't want it just about be about preserving the past and going back to normal as what it used to be. What we want to ask is, what will it be? What do you have for us now? What is a new thing that you want to do among your people? Reveal that to us. Show us. And then give us the courage, Lord. Courage more than we can hope or imagine in order to walk the path that you lie, lay in front of us. Uh, to reveal it to us. As I thought about today, I thought that we were standing at our own Red Sea, just as Moses did. And as they stood there, there were so many voices saying that we're doomed. What will we do next? What is the answer? And then in that moment, at Moses, with Moses, you showed up. And you showed yourself and your power. And you showed a way to safety. Oh, how we desperately need that today. Show up. Show us. Lead us to safety that only you can lead us to. And we know that before all that we have walked through in this life, uh, to be honest, we have really uh, misunderstood and been complacent about understanding who you are. Forgive us of that, Lord. We drive through our streets. We see signs and storefronts that say, we can get through this together. And that's true. But Lord, we realize that we can only get through anything you bring into our life because of you. And that's the most important thing. So we ask that you anoint this time. Our time of worship with your presence. Bathe our time together with who you are. Be so thick today among us that it's like we have to cut the, your presence with a knife. Transform us. Change us. Inspire us. Let us not be people that we have been or were before. But give us a skip in our step understanding that you are our God. Lord, we offer this prayer. This time of worship, this time of gathering, and we offer this prayer in the name that's above all names. A wonderful name, a mighty counselor, almighty God. And his name is Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. It's hard to do that when you have an empty worship center. But as we gather back today and we think about this uh, new sermon series that we're about to enter into, Psalm 23, it is known as the uh, Psalm of all Psalms because when you mention Psalms, uh, people immediately think of Psalm 23. It is the cream of the crop of all Psalms. As we look at it today, what's your first memory of Psalm 23? For me, I was in elementary school. Uh, the church that my family attended had something known as a sword drill. Uh, we in elementary school, we memorized our books of the Bible, and then uh, at the Sunday night worship time, we stood before that group, and they would call out a verse of Scripture. And the first one that got to that verse of Scripture would step forward, and then we would read what we had found 
And then we'd step back and they would do the same thing for another verse of Scripture. But we also memorize different Scripture verses in the Bible. And so they may call out uh, the memory verse. And if you knew it, you would step forward. And one of those memory verses was Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Maybe a more recent memory for you of Psalm 23 might be with all the hand washing and sanitizing we've been going through. They say we need to do that for 20 seconds. And so they've encouraged us, for us to know exactly when 20 seconds is up, that you could pray the Lord's Prayer or you can quote Psalm 23 as you wash your hands. Uh, maybe that's a memory you have of, for you. Uh, for me, it was uh, about three weeks ago. I stood in a personal care facility and I placed my hand on the head of a friend knowing that it was only hours or days before he was going to go into eternity and to quote the, that verse over him. And I can't tell you what it means. And I will dwell. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then this past Monday, I stood next to the bed of our sweet friend, Martha Oliver. And I quoted that scripture. And then we gathered for her graveside service on Friday. And everyone that was around the graveside quoted Psalm 23. What's your recent memory uh, of Psalm 23? King David is given credit to be the author of Psalm 23. Bible scholars say that he was reviewing his life. He was looking back on his life of how good God had been to him. And so he was just writing all that goodness down. Uh, he was the king of Israel, the mightiest nation of that time. So as he was reviewing, he was saying, throughout all my journey of life, God was with me. Maybe we could take a page out of uh, King David's life. And maybe we could just review our life and count the different ways. God has blessed us. David knew without a doubt that God had been with him all of his life. In the good times and in the not so good times. There's going to be more that we're going to uncover about Psalm 23 as we move into this uh, psalm throughout the next couple of weeks. But today I want us to look at the three most important words of this psalm. The three most important words are the first three words of verse 1. Because it says the Lord is. And it's like a blank there. For us to look and say, who is the Lord for us? Well, David defined the relationship that he had with God in five words. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. Not his shepherd or someone else's shepherd, but my shepherd. For David, it was the center hub. It was a centerpiece of his life that he could not do life without God. Because he was the shepherd that was leading him, that was before him, that was with him throughout his life. It was not a hope so, it was not a maybe. It wasn't if I live my life right and I don't do bad, then maybe he might be my God. No, it was my shepherd. For us this day, before we go any further in understanding what Psalm 23 has for us, we might need to wrestle with that. Is he leading you? Is he your shepherd? Is he the point where you can't do life without him in life? Or are you just living life on your own? Because so much of the time we hear people say, oh, I believe in God. But do you know him as your shepherd? That's what it boils down to. And so the three most important words for us, uh, the Lord is. Who is the Lord for you, for me? And that leads us to the next part that we're going to look at in more detail today. And it's in verse 3. Because in verse 3, it's just some more treasures uh, that we can just uncover here. 
because he says that he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, he leads me in path. When you think of the word path, what, what comes to your mind? Maybe you're thinking about uh, a well-worn path that's through the woods. Uh, maybe it's a very designated path path that you can walk through. Maybe it's a trail. It's easy to follow type of deal. In our Western culture, when we think of the image of path or read that word, we have an image that we place into this verse of Scripture. Oh, that's it. It's something that is straight and it's just well defined for us. As you look in your Bible, your translation may say straight path. It may say right path. And it's always going directly forward. In our culture, uh, that's the kind of path that we want to follow. We want to follow something that's well-defined, that it's easy, that's before us. Uh, that's not the image that David uses in the original Hebrew. In the original language for David, the path that he uh, was describing wasn't straight. It wasn't narrow. It wasn't well-defined. But he was using it in the Hebrew term that means round and round. Really? Yup. Let's go back and understand that David was a shepherd and he had seen this round and round lived out not only in his own life but in the life of other shepherds that he witnessed as well. Uh, in Israel the landscape and the geography is very much a desert terrain. And when you look at the desert mountains that are in Israel, uh, you will see some rings that are on these mountains. Uh, they're a lighter color. And you wonder what has caused that lighter color of this ring that's around this mountain. You see, as you look at the mountain, you see that there's vegetation and there's nourishment that's at the top. And so you're wondering, has, has water caused that? Has sediment caused that ring-like feature on that mountain? The closer you get to it, and understanding how David is describing it in Psalm 23, you realize that it is a very narrow path that's wide enough for maybe one sheep to go up the mountain to follow their shepherd as they go toward the nourishment that is on the top. You see, those rings on the mountainside were deliberate path. They were slow path. They were a safe path, a path that went around the mountain because shepherds did not take their sheep directly up or straight up the mountain because it was too steep and it was too dangerous. When David writes, he leads me in path of righteousness. That's the image that he wrote about. This slow, round the hill, round the mountain, reaching the top. In 2014, Becky and I were very fortunate to go to Israel. Uh, this will show you a scene. This doesn't do it justice, but you see the terrain and how deep and steep it was and how they led them on a path that went around in order to get to the very top. Uh, you see the sheer and the steep landscape uh, that makes these mountains up that the sheep would graze upon. Uh, if the shepherd tried to take the sheep directly up uh, on the shortcut to get to the top, then the sheep may fall. It may hurt itself. It may break a leg. It may injure itself. The only way to safely get your sheep to the top of the mountain was to go around it. Our nature in our Western culture is that we don't want to do the round and round and round. No. We want to take the shortcut. We want to take the, uh, the quickest way because we've got places to go. We've got people to see. Uh, and we don't even stop to ask for directions. We just want to get up there as quickly as we can. Uh, but that's our nature. David looks back on his life and he says, you know, uh, 
There's so many times in my life that I would have loved to have taken the short path. I would love for God to have given me the short cut. But God always took me the long way around. He took me the safe way because it was the best way. We see this illustrated in the life of David in uh, 1 Samuel 24. Uh, Read that this afternoon. Wonderful story. But the background of 1 Samuel 24 is that David was a shepherd. He was tending sheep out on the hillside. Uh, The prophet Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel behind King Saul, who was the first king. And uh, this king would be found in the house of Jesse. And David was the youngest son of Jesse. And so Samuel comes in and he begins to look at all the brothers of David. And as he does, it's not him. Is there anyone else? They call David in and that's the one that God has chosen to be the next king. So when is this going to happen? I mean, I want to know, uh, when is the coronation going to happen? When will I be this next king? Well, the back story is that as King Saul continued to serve, he became very jealous of David. And so he sought to kill David and his men, and he chased him throughout Israel, and it led him to an, o- an oasis-type place known as En Gedi. Waterfalls, greenery, lush. It's a place that David knew firsthand as he was a shepherd, a young boy leading his sheep, that he would spend time there. So he was well known about this place known as En Gedi. Well, David was hiding from Saul in a cave with his men. And wouldn't you know it, King Saul chose that particular cave to go into. And the men of David began to say, oh, David, look. Look what the Lord has brought to you. He brought King Saul into your presence, and you can kill him now, and you can now become king of Israel. But David doesn't listen to those voices. He doesn't want to kill King Saul, but he does want to send him a message. What David does is that he crawls up behind Saul, and he takes his knife, and he cuts off the end of his robe and the tassels that are there. And as Saul leaves that cave, David follows him, and he says, in a paraphrase, he said, Saul, listen, if I wanted to kill you, I could have. And he holds up the end of the robe. But that's not what I chose to do. That's not how God wants to do it. I'm not going to take your life and force God's will upon me or upon Israel. But I'm yielding. I'm going to do it God's way. Instead of taking the shortcut up the hill and try to get to the top, I'll take my time. And I'll trust God. And I'll trust His plan. And I know that God's going to work this out. How does that story speak to us? It's such a wonderful story. And the thing about Scripture is that even though it's thousands of years old, it teaches us how to navigate life today and what we need to do. You see, for us, just like David, we may be saying, God, I've been waiting. I've been praying and praying and praying for hours for days, for weeks, for months, for this. I have been trusting you with that. And I haven't seen you, God. And we get frustrated with that. Why haven't you done something, God? But look at what we can learn from David. It's such an example for us as we're walking the path that God has put before us. Because maybe you find yourself in a season of waiting Uh, You've been praying, believing, and you're asking, why can't I have that now? Maybe in this season, you're tempted to walk off the path. You're tempted to take the shortcut. Uh, You want to cut your own corners and get on up the hill. 
the encouragement that we find from David's story is that we just keep walking. We keep trusting. Uh, we keep being faithful with what he's called us to be. Walking around the path that God has laid out before us on the mountain that we're walking with God as our shepherd. Don't listen to the distracting lies of the enemy that want to take you off the path. But we walk his righteous path. And as we walk his path, here like David is what we do. We understand that if we really want to get closer to God, people that we've seen before us, they've gotten there because they've been faithful in following the path. The path that God laid out before them, instead of trying to run back, uh, take the shortcut, uh, they've learned in the hardships that they have wrestled with God, they have questioned with God, but yet they still trust God. That even though I don't understand where I am and what I am dealing with, I am still trusting you because as they walk the path, they just understand. More so, God's character, God's nature, His faithfulness, His goodness, and His love. As I prepared for today, Craig Rochelle had written uh, this statement down, and I thought, that is so much about this image of path of righteousness. Because Craig Rochelle said, I have walked with Jesus for enough yesterdays to trust him with all of my tomorrows. I have walked with Jesus with enough yesterdays to trust him with my tomorrows. As simple as that may sound to you, I hope that we can understand the same security uh, we can have in our life and the path that we're walking. Uh, do you want to be close to God? Is the intimacy with Him more important than just... Uh, a comfortable, easygoing, straightforward path for you? Do you want to know that He is with you and cares about you no matter what you're going through? Well, know this, get well. As you grow to know God, He will reveal even more, his, more of His love, of His faithfulness, of His grace, and over time, over time you will realize and believe and embrace that even when life is difficult, that God is still good. Why? Because in the path that we walk, He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper. He's a light in the darkness. That's who my God is. Because the Lord is my shepherd. And he leads me. Me. In paths of righteousness. For his namesake. That's what we claim today. That's what we hold on to today. I'm going to pray as we close this service out. We'll sing a song. And as we sing the song, you know, we've done in the past having altars open. And you're thinking today, regathering back, can I come to the altar? You bet. How long has it been? We will practice social distance. You can stand. You can do whatever. But we can come to Him. And may we never lose the privilege again of being with Him at this altar. Let me pray over us. You invite us to come to you. 
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just as with David, uh, we understand exactly how you were beside us, before us, behind us, leading us. On this day, Lord, as we gather in this place, we're so desperate for you. I look out and I see so many faces, so many journeys of faith, so many paths. If we had a choice, we would not have chosen that path. But as we walked that path, you led us and you continue to lead us. And we want to honor you as our shepherd. And so as we sing these words, as we regather for worship, we leave this place with you being the only one that matters, an audience of one, because your children have gathered to worship. It's in the sweet name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.